There's a new PS5 controller on the way. We got some updates on The Last of Us HBO show. Cyberpunk 2077 just got a huge update I've been waiting for, and so did No Man's Sky. So the Uncharted movie comes out this weekend, and just from the trailers and the way Sony's been marketing it, a lot of people, myself included, were not exactly hyped for it. It just didn't really look like the Uncharted movie we've been waiting years and years for, which kind of makes sense because this was announced a long time ago. It has lost a ton of directors. It's lost a couple writers, and they cast Tom Holland super late. It just never really seemed like it was coming together, but the reviews haven't been horrible. Last time I checked, it was like around a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, which isn't great, but it's not the abysmal failure that a lot of people were expecting. So even though the reception of this is lukewarm, this is their first thing they're putting out under the PlayStation Studios banner. They even have a new intro for it that's kind of like the one you see before new games like Horizon Forbidden West, but it's a little bit different. It's pretty epic and lines up pretty well with the Marvel Studios one and the DC Studios one. I like what they're doing over there at PlayStation. And honestly, it makes me get my hopes up for this Last of Us HBO show that we have coming out kind of soon. I think last time we talked about this show, I thought it was going to come out in 2022 because that's how it seemed. Like they spent a long time filming it. They finished filming it a few months ago. It seemed like they were just in editing and they were gonna have it out by the end of this year. But unfortunately, it looks like it's coming out in 2023. Now that's kind of a bummer, but this delay doesn't seem like it's down to reshoots or any of the crazy stuff that the Uncharted movie went through. And honestly, everything like from the limited amount we've seen of The Last of Us show looks really good. I saw a video where Joel was on his horse riding into what looks like the college. So that obviously takes place after the Tommy section in the story. We've seen that one teaser where it's like the over the shoulder shot of Joel and Ellie. It looks like The Last of Us, but in live action. And that's what I want. The one thing that's bugging me about this is that it's an adaptation of the first game. So it's like, what is the audience here, right? Like if you watch the show and it's literally the game start to finish, you're not gonna wanna go play the game because it's the exact same story. And if the show comes out and it's just the same story as the game you've played a million times, why would you wanna watch the show, right? Like they kinda gotta justify it to both audiences, but I feel like the way they're going to do that is by just making it really good, which is an awesome strategy, right? Like the creative team on board with the show is great. And hearing that it might be delayed until 2023 got me to look into some leaks. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but they did say that they're going to add cut content from the game. And hearing that, that's what makes me want to watch it because the game is perfect as is. I think the pacing is great. I love all the different locations, all the different characters. I'm really honestly excited to see Bill because his section is my second favorite section of the game, my favorite being the college. But yeah, if they're going off the beaten path a little bit and adding stuff that was cut, I think that's gonna be cool and it's gonna give me a reason to watch the show. Pedro Pascal is flawless casting for Joel and if they are changing up certain aspects of the story, maybe we won't get the adaptation of The Last of Us Part Two. I don't wanna spoil what happens at the beginning of that game, but yeah, to have a season one where you really fall in love with Pedro Pascal as Joel and then it goes right into the second game. Like, I feel like they could explore some stories in between the games so we get a little bit more screen time with the Mandalorian himself. So yeah, while Uncharted is off to a lukewarm start, it seems like it's just getting the ball rolling for higher quality content because yeah, the next thing we're getting is The Last of Us TV show. They're also working on a Twisted Metal TV show with Anthony Mackie starring and producing. And then we're also getting a Ghost of Tsushima movie where if you laid all of this out, I feel like that has the potential to be the best thing in this PlayStation Studios slate of TV shows and movies. I don't know, I just feel like Ghost of Tsushima, if they do it right, use a lot of practical effects, cast the right people in it, it could be a really badass movie. I just hope, again, they change the story up because I don't wanna go see a movie that's like a condensed, 50 hour game that's two hours long. And I don't think many gamers feel differently on that. Also, it would be really weird if the movie version of Ghost of Tsushima was better than the game because then it would be like, why is the game 50 hours? If they could do it in two and a half hours, why did they make it 50, you know? All right, so as predicted, CD Projekt Red, instead of doing this huge drawn out lead up to the new 1.5 update for Cyberpunk 2077, they did a live stream earlier this week and during that live stream, the update went live. And honestly guys, this is really good and I wish the game launched in this state on consoles back when it came out. Because on PC, where I played it, it was pretty good, right? Like it had bugs, it was hard to run it at 60 frames per second, but they patched that version of the game pretty quickly. And I really like Cyberpunk 2077 
77, but man, they added in a ton of stuff with this new 1.5 update. The big bummer here is that the ray tracing they added into the game makes the game run at 30 frames per second. I don't love that. I would highly recommend running the dynamic 4K 60 frames per second mode. This is a first person shooter and when you have all your powers and you're just blowing people's arms off, you wanna make sure it's running at 60 frames per second. And the like baked in lighting that they did that's not ray traced is actually really good, especially at night when you're driving through Night City and you see all the neon lights and stuff and the fog effects are really rolling in. It looks awesome. There's some crazy stuff they added too. Like there's new AI for crowds. So if you go and aim your gun at a car window, people will react differently. Some people will get scared. Some people will just floor it and start going into rage mode, drive away. Some people just faint and then you just drag them out of their car and you can steal it, which is kind of cool. On the motorcycle side of things, they added LED lights to every single motorcycle wheel, which is sweet. The perk system got a rework from top to bottom. They took some perks out. They added some perks in. They changed how some perks work. So even if you're going back in with a character that's towards the end of the game and you have a lot of perks unlocked, they're refunding all of your perk points because everything is so different. So you can completely respec your character. Of course, the biggest update here, the biggest of all is that you can go to V's apartment and you can change the way V looks because that was the most bizarre thing. I made my V look horrible at the beginning of the game and then I went to my apartment to change the way he looked because you know, it's called cyberpunk and it's an RPG and you should be able to change the way your character looks only to find I was stuck with this horrific looking character for the entire 50 hour game. So yeah, there are two big things missing. One of them being the ability to reset street crimes. That would be awesome because that will give you a lot of combat encounters that you can go check out all over the map. And the other one is new game plus. Now I'm back and forth on that. At first I really wanted new game plus so I could take all the guns and stuff I unlocked the first time around into a new story and play through the entire thing again. But it seems like they've changed so much from top to bottom in this. I kind of want to go through all the fixers and do all their gigs again to really re-earn those awards that you get at the end of their quest chain. I want to just experience the story again with all of these new updates. And I feel like unlocking guns is going to be a lot more fun because they completely rewritten the loot table. Like the way loot drops in this game is even completely different. So either way, it's been a long enough time where I feel like it's going to feel like a new experience when I jump back in. If you have the PS4 edition, you get the free upgrade. It's kind of a pain, of course, like every other PS4 to PS5 upgrade is a pain, but once you do it, you're in the game, you're in the next gen version. They did a good job with this patch, and I really hope this is the beginning of CD Projekt going back to their Witcher 3 era where everyone liked them because, I don't know, they screwed up a lot with the launch, but they're one of my favorite companies in the video game industry, and I hope this is a big turning point for them because we know that they're working on multiplayer for Cyberpunk. At first, it was going to be a standalone multiplayer game, but now they've rebuilt the Cyberpunk engine to add multiplayer into the current version of it. We know there's a paid expansion coming soon. And yeah, they've got to be working on New Game Plus and resetting street crimes because people data mined it. So I feel like we're on a better path here. I feel like we're basically at the game's true launch. And it took a long time to get here, which kind of sucked, but you've had plenty of opportunities to get this game for five bucks. And it is well worth five dollars. But if you haven't bought it yet, you can buy it right now for 30 bucks. And it is also worth that. We're just going to keep rolling into the update news, though, because another game that launched in a really bad state, but is now extremely good, got another huge update and it is No Man's Sky, which just got its Sentinel DLC update. So the big focus here on this update is combat. They've upgraded the enemies you're fighting in the game. They've added in new weapons. They've changed the way combat as a whole work to the point where you can take your mech exosuit and install an AI on it and make it fight alongside you instead of just being able to ride in it, which sounds awesome. I'm really excited to jump back in and try this out. And the cool thing is like every other No Man's Sky update, this is completely free. So their business model right now is basically like you buy the game to get these free updates that they keep adding over time. And I think that's really cool. The combat is the one thing that I feel like they needed to address and I didn't know they were working on it. So the last time they updated the game and we talked about it, basically they did the graphics like completely from the ground up for PlayStation 5. I was like, man, I hope the next thing they work on is the combat. I know there's like a million games coming out right now between Horizon Forbidden West. We've got Elden Ring. Dying Light 2 is a long, long game. So I'm sure a lot of people are still playing that. We of course just got this upgrade for Cyberpunk 2077 but No Man's Sky is one of the coolest survival games ever made now. I know if you played it at launch, that sounds probably too good to be true, but it is very good now. I love it. Out of all the survival games I've played, it's the one I always come back to, and I have so much fun just starting a new character, making my starship, blasting off, and flying throughout the galaxy. I mean, you get a freighter now, and you can explore it. There's so much stuff that's been added for free, and I'm glad that Hello Games stuck with it. I feel like at this point, 
though, they could probably work on some paid DLC, really get some income coming in because they've crossed that point where I'm mad at them and now I'm just like, I want to give you money. I bought this game at launch for $60 and it almost feels criminal that I've been getting all this free content for years. Like it's insane. So yeah, the update is out now, it's free. I'm gonna download it, but the big game I'm looking forward to right now after I dig into Horizon and basically no life that game so I can beat it in time is the Witch Queen expansion for Destiny 2. I know you guys are gonna say dead game, but I love Destiny 2, it's so good. So there's a new DualSense out there called the Airshock and it's just a concept right now, but this one looks like it's actually going to become real and it's basically made for rage quitters, like people who throw their controller at the wall, throw it at the TV. This one still might break your TV, but there's going to be less of a chance of that because it is completely inflatable. Like it's a clear plastic controller that blows up and then it, you hold in your hands like a little air bed or an air mattress and then it's got the buttons on the top panel. It looks really weird, but it actually looks kind of comfortable. I don't know, I really want to try it out. It's from a designer called Yanko Design who also made an inflatable keyboard last year and it looks like it's translated over every button. You've got the D-pad, you've got the square circle cross triangle, you've got start, select, you've got the touchpad, you've got the triggers, everything you need is on this controller. Now from the pictures on the website, it looks like the hole in the back you have to blow into, which kind of removes a little bit of fun and utility from it. So you can keep one of those like little air compressors that you get with an air mattress, like those Coleman ones that you shove into the little hole. You can just keep one of those in your backpack and plug it in. Or if you have that one friend who's always chucking your controllers around, like when you're playing Street Fighter V or Mortal Kombat or something, you can just reach into your backpack and be like, I got the controller for you, buddy. And you start blowing it up, you inflate it. He'll be good to go. My favorite part about the design is the USB-C connector because there's a wire that goes from underneath the touchpad to the back of the controller. And it just looks really cool. Like the fact that it's completely clear. I think it'd be sweet if Sony was able to make a clear dual sense. I know they made an opaque clear DualShock 4 in the past, but just like a completely see-through dual sense would be awesome. I know there's other controllers like the Aftershock ones that glow, but like they feel and look kind of cheap. We've actually looked at a clear PS5 controller from our friend Cody and that was actually pretty sweet. So yeah, I'd love to see an official dual sense from Sony that's clear because this inflatable one, while a cool concept, is uh, creating more problems than it solves, I think. All right, so the last story I have for you guys today is another collaboration between the Horizon franchise and a completely different brand. This time, it is Seagate, and they're making some new game-ready drives for the PlayStation 5. Now, unfortunately, these are USB 3.2, so you're not gonna be able to run PlayStation 5 games off of them, but you are going to be able to transfer your PlayStation 5 games to store on these drives, and then when you wanna play them, you can transfer them back to your internal SSDs, and you'll be good to go. The cool thing is, they've been doing this for a long time on Xbox, like I have a Gears of War 5 drive that's clear see-through like ice, and it has the Gears of War skull on it. it. Looks pretty cool. They're now doing a Horizon Forbidden West edition, and if it goes well, they're gonna partner up with some other PlayStation exclusive IPs and make some custom game drives. Now, the irony is not lost on me that they're making a drive for Horizon Forbidden West, but this is a PlayStation 5 game that you can't run off the hard drive, but if you do have a PlayStation 4, you can run Horizon Forbidden West off of this drive on your PlayStation 4 which is pretty cool. So with the Horizon one specifically, there's a two terabyte one for $100 and there's a special five terabyte one for $159. I would go obviously with the five terabyte one because you're getting more than double the storage for about half the price on top. Like that seems like a no brainer. What I would really like Seagate and Sony to do is make an SSD that'll allow you to plug it into the USB-C port and run games off of it. I know it's probably not gonna be as fast as the onboard SSD in the PS5, the loading times might be a little longer than the onboard storage on the PlayStation 5, but if you're talking a matter of like two seconds, you're probably not gonna notice it. It's good to see PlayStation and Seagate working together on something like this. I'm sure they just had some sort of deal that had to expire with Xbox because Seagate makes these expansion cards for the Xbox Series X and S that are way overpriced. Like they almost cost the same amount as the actual console, especially if you have a Series S, and they can also cost even more than a console. So they're way overpriced. This is a much better option in my my opinion, even though it is USB 3.0. But yeah, I'd really like to see them make a portable SSD because even if it doesn't work with PlayStation 5 games, it would be cool to have that in my bag for like videos I edit for PlayStation Ready. I could pull my sick Horizon SSD out and be good to go. You know, I got a couple SSDs and I put stickers on them, but I want a cool custom branded PlayStation 5 one. Anyway guys, that's all I have for you today. So make sure you let me know what you think down in the comments below. And remember to subscribe and set your notifications to all if you haven't already. As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.